Get ready for actionable marketing insight you can apply to help you reach, connect, and convert rural American consumers. Hop in the front seat as you'll be riding shotgun with Cliff Callis, your OutDrive host, as he takes you down the road to success. Let's go. Hey, folks, welcome to OutDrive. I'm Cliff Callis, and we've got another great story to share with you today about business and life in rural America. Today, our guest is the third generation CEO of Interstate Studio, Eric Snyder Jr. Interstate is North America's largest family owned school photography planner and yearbook publishing company. And when you think about all the change that has occurred with cameras, schools, digital technology, and online shopping over the past generation, I think it says a lot about the entire team at Interstate to have thrived from rural America. And I've known Eric for a number of years, but I've really gotten to know him well through our volunteer work on the board of directors for the Center of Human Services, a nationally known provider of services to those with disabilities. And Eric brings an experienced business perspective to our board. And uh, we're all very grateful that he and Interstate are all behind CHS. He grew up in Sedalia, Missouri. He earned his degree in business from Drury College in Springfield. And he has invested his entire career working his way up the ranks of the publishing company founded by his grandfather in 1933. He's one of those young people who grew up out here in the country, got his education, and came back home to share his talents and educations with us. Welcome to Outdrive, Eric. Thank you, Cliff. Thanks for asking me to, to join. Looking forward to it. Well, I've been looking forward to it, too. You know, we both grew up in family businesses. Um and growing up, I never would have thought I would have gone into retail, which I did. And then I never would have thought I'd go into marketing, which I also did. But uh, for you growing up, what did the future look like? If I was to ask you as a kid, what do you want to do when you grow up? What would you say? You know, that's a difficult question to answer because I, I never had anything specifically that I always wanted to be. My parents and uh, grandparents always encouraged me to be anything that I wanted to be. And so, you know, it's, I never had a very specific, I want to be this when I grow up. I've just enjoyed learning and, and experiencing things to finally land where, where I've landed. So that's a tough question to answer. You know, when you, there's so many opportunities. So there were so many things that you could, uh, that you want to be, you know, as a, as a kid, but. Uh, so uh, what took you to business? You studied business at Drury. What took you there? You know, I, as I then got older and started working here at Interstate at 15 and, and not just working in maintenance and sweeping floors and, and doing that kind of stuff, I really started getting exposed to uh, training in the field. So when we would uh, train for our photography equipment and, and getting exposure to our sales force and spending time with them, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed that part of what, uh, what we do here at Interstate, but in general, just that working with people and, and exposure and interacting, uh, working with teams. And so it, that's what drew me to a business education. So what was life growing up in a small town, working part-time as you go through high school? It was, you know, going out and spending time. I, we grew up, uh, you know, south of Sedalia here on, on Flat Creek. So spending a lot of time down at the creek and at farm ponds and, and uh, out camping and spend a lot of time outside with friends. And you know, I'm very fortunate to, to have most all of my family and extended family here in Sedalia and surrounding areas. So a lot of time with family and friends. So it was, uh, you know, it's home. Yeah. Well, and I, I know you still live in the country. Um, how do you think it's changed over the years? How have you seen it change? You know, and I was fortunate to, it was within the state, but to get to move around in the state and live in St. Louis and Kansas City and, and uh, obviously in Springfield. And I think the biggest change that I noticed, especially coming back, is the world's just gotten smaller. Uh, the things that, that were difficult to have access to growing up, that isn't as uh, big of an issue as it used to be. You're able to get, uh, you know, some of those things that you would go up to the city for on the weekends that now you can get the next day or the day after that. So it's just uh, not just those items, but just just everything that connection to people and the world's just gotten smaller. 
Yeah. And I think it's easier to get around. It's yeah. easier to communicate with people. We have more vehicles to do that. Yeah. Text me, phone me, fax me. Well, maybe not fax. Well, yeah, there's still fax. You could. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, tell us about Interstate. How has it changed over the years? You know, we're almost into our 90s. So uh, it's obviously changed uh, a lot since 1933. The name and the story for, for Interstate, you know, we're in the Depression, and uh, my grandfather had taken a lot of pictures of uh, family pictures, traveled around the country, uh, would go into small towns and rent out a, a building downtown and do family pictures and then uh, move on to the next town. When that started to uh, not be as profitable, he moved back here to Sedalia and then uh, actually was on his way up to Kansas City to find another job. and still had that equipment and ran into a friend that had a bunch of uh, chemicals and paper. So they, they sat down and he had, he had heard about out East. There were some companies that had started or some people that started taking pictures in schools. And so he got in the car and uh, head down the newly built interstate system and uh, stroke literally up to I-70 and started driving down uh, the interstate and calling on schools along the way and taking their pictures and developing them. And that's where the name came from. So Interstate Studio. Interesting. I always wondered that. Yeah. Yeah. So as it, you know, as it grew from uh, offering, you know, group photography, there were a lot of group photographers back even before the 30s. But then the individual pictures and then into what we call composites, where you have all the individual students' pictures lined up on on an 8x10 or 5x7. So composites, doing elementary school yearbooks, color photography, using lights instead of uh, natural light through windows, using uh, strobes to light subjects. And, and then, like I said, color photography and many changes up through there through uh, color prints, then into the digital age and revolution and, and scanning film, then into digital capture, and then from you know, silver halide into uh, uh, inkjet printing or your, into your press printing products. So it's changed a lot. It has changed a lot. You know, I've been in your facilities several times over the years. At what point did you actually get into the production side of your business? So we had presses again with yearbooks. You know, we had presses back in the 50s and 60s. We would have started printing uh, and did some commercial printing then. But really, the shift would have been early 2000s, where we would have really gotten into the digital presses and the, the digital printing first for yearbooks and, and other products like that. And then uh, in the last five, six years, seven years has been then a shift over from our silver halide for portraits. And we use the presses for printing portraits. So that's happened relatively recently. Well, it's mind boggling to think about all the change you just described there over the last 90 years. And of course, a lot of that change has occurred in the last 20 years, really. Yeah. Well, it's an impressive operation and the way that you maintain it is equally impressive. You know, when we think about some of the fastest moving technologies that are impacting us, you know, artificial intelligence is really right at the top in the marketing business. How has it made its way into your business? Well, definitely in marketing, the same way there. We use AI for analyzing uh, areas for growth potential or opportunities. But even in production, we've been using, we use AI to streamline those processes in here so that we're as, as efficient as possible. So could I make the assumption that it's going to become more and more important as we go forward? Absolutely. It's exciting. It's a new, new way to do business. Absolutely. So you're a marketing guy. I know you ran the marketing operations at Interstate for a number of years before moving to your current role. What do you think are the advantages of running a business when you have this marketing mindset? Yeah. You know, my dad, when when I did ultimately start with Interstate, I was actually in St. Louis and in the sales uh, in the sales side. And that was something very important to my dad. I know he thought through that he wanted me to come up through the sales and marketing. He was always in production here at Interstate. And uh, he really wanted me to have an exposure to that and experience that. And so that really has been my 
my channel and my path through interstate. And like you said before, taking over these responsibilities through marketing, I, being able to have such a strong understanding, which that's probably too big of a word, but at least an exposure uh, of your customers and what's important to them. You really, in marketing, you get that level of exposure and it's gotten more the last few years when we've been able to to more directly communicate with our end customer. Um, but even just with our schools, whether it's through your surveys or focus groups that you do, it's just a great way to, to really truly understand who your customers are, what their needs are and how we can better meet them. So I, I assume that your customers are both located in urban areas as well as rural America. When I say the phrase rural America, what comes to mind? You know, obviously having grown up in rural America and in the Midwest and in Sedalia, it's always hard when you say rural, I think immediately of here and in the Midwest. But you know what's what's been enlightening to see and experience is that we are in multiple states and we work in many rural areas throughout the country. As I think about that, I guess I would respond with community. It's really interesting. No matter where you go, everybody is in a is in a tight knit community that either revolves around the school, you know, the same things that we enjoy here, where you go into a restaurant, everybody knows everybody, and it's that constant exposure to the same groups of people because you're you work with them and you go to lunch with them and you go to church with them and you go to I mean, it, you run into all these same people and it's the same way everywhere. And it's a neat to see that community and the way this, that schools, school systems and, and schools work and exist within communities and to see sometimes those are such large parts of rural communities is the sports or the schools themselves. And, and again, that's my exposure to these rural areas as I get to travel around, but it's uh we have people that will come in and we'll go, you know, go to lunch and they'll come in from out of town and come from larger cities. And, and, you know, you go and I might even see you there, Cliff and, you know, hi and hi and hi, and they'll leave. And everybody's like, what are you mayor? Like, (laughs) (laughs) you know, everybody in town, you know, everybody. And when you live in the, in the larger cities, you kind of forget that because you, you do get used to I'm not saying you never run into somebody, but you very rarely do. And so you kind of escape from that and can go off and go eat and you probably won't see anybody that you've ever met before. Yeah. In rural areas, it's it's quite different. So it is truly one of the things that I enjoy about it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, family before, and uh, I know you have other members of your family involved in your business and, uh, Again, since we both have family business experience, I know there are, are sometimes challenges and, and opportunities to have to have family in the business. How do you guys work together to maybe overcome some of these challenges? You know, it's, I agree, I hear you. There's always a challenge and, and there can be. And I think that uh, communication and trust is very important. But in addition to that, I think for us, we're very fortunate in that all of us have very different areas of responsibility and talent. And so it's, I think it works well for us, knock on wood, that, <laughs> that I don't jinx it, but uh, no, there's always something. And I, especially this year, you know, it's, there's always challenges that come up that push on everybody, but we're very fortunate that, you know, with my sister and her focus on, on finance and accounting and that area of our business. And then my brother-in-law, Dave, you know, his is in operations and production and have him be able to, to stay focused. And then for mine, for sales and marketing, and again, just the way it's all structured. And then my dad's still involved, but we have another division or another company, um, convertible solutions that he's able to, to focus on. And so we're all able to, again, it's that communication and trust. We communicate, trust each other that we, uh, obviously all have the same interests at heart and, uh, uh, and that that works well for us, but uh, it, there's always something, so it can be. Yeah, but you you guys have such a great team, and I think that experience is irreplaceable. I wouldn't trade the time in our family businesses over the years for anything. 
Um, and you just, it just takes the getting to know each other to a whole nother level uh, that sometimes you don't get the opportunity to experience. You know, you mentioned uh, the last year, and of course we're recording this uh, early 2021. I know the pandemic impacted your business. We talked about that and schools are your top customer and uh, many schools were, and some continue to be operating in different ways. Um, what kind of things have you had to change to kind of minimize the impact? And then what is 2021 looking like? You know, the, the challenge has been managing the uncertainty, as you, you mentioned, you know, with the schools, the schools really are the gatekeepers for us to our customers. And so if the schools aren't there, then we don't have access to those customers. And then, you know, especially with this last year, it's, we've been up to the schools to whether they're going to be in session or not. So it really has been trying to manage out as far as we can without going too far and overextending ourselves and managing what it's, this is a service business. And so, you know, the hard part is, is that it, it's managing, you know, our labor and other expenses that are our biggest, our biggest expense, our biggest challenge when there's such uncertainty going forward. So for us and our business cycles on, you know, schools being in. So like last year, it was very challenging when school stopped in March, you know, we weren't even going to have the prospect of starting back up again until August or September. And so we have to kind of walk through the beginnings of these years and things to look at it from a, what if something like that were to happen again, and we've got to get, so it's kind of every week we get, and every month you get, you're appreciative and um, keep walking down the road, but it's, we've changed. It really has forced us. And we have an absolutely amazing team and group of people here that have, you know, supported and, and helped us navigate through this and, uh, you know, our employees that work on the floor and, and those in management and out in the field, it's, it's really taken a lot of trust and understand and, you know, communication to, to try to get through it. But we've, we've had to change a lot of the ways in which we do everything that we do, you know, just kind of change some of the rules, break a lot of the rules. Maybe there have been some silver linings as a result of all this as well. Yeah. You know, you mentioned it. services, your service business services is all about people and uh, you're basically a people business. And um, I know you have a great reputation for taking care of your employees and that uh, many employees and really extended family members uh, are a part of your family in total. What do you think they like about working in interstate? Just yesterday, my brother-in-law and I were able to walk around and we, we like to celebrate the longevity of a lot of our employees. We like to recognize everybody every five years. Um, and so I always enjoy doing that. And it's amazing to me when the number of people that will have that'll 20 years or 25 years or 40 years, and they're people that I've known for so long. And it's, it's so much fun to look and see, see them and talk and go, it's been 20 years. Like, you know, it's, you know, yeah. they, I was like, only supposed amazing. To, yeah. I was only supposed to be here like one year. And we, of course, everybody talks seasons here. So, you know, that cyclical part uh, of our business and I was only going to work one season and now here it's 20 years later and I'm, I'm still here. And, but I think, you know, one of the things I hope it's the culture. I mean, that my parents, work very hard to, and, and my grandparents too, but to create a very positive culture here that not only did we say that we care about our people, but, you know, walk the walk. And uh, they set a very high bar for my sister, my brother-in-law and I to, to meet, but they really truly uh, cared about their employees and, and the stories that I hear from either about my parents or, or my grandparents, the, what they did and how they, they helped people through. I hope that that's part of it and that environment. But I also think a lot of it's just the work that we have. It's the changes of things that too. It's just when you're just about fed up with putting pictures in an envelope, you get to shift and go do something else. And then when you're about done with your books, then you get to shift and go do something else. And before you know it, you wake up and it's been 20 years. <laughs> That amazing. So thinking back about all that time growing up in the, in the business, what are some life lessons that you learned early on that has stuck with you? 
for sure. I, and, you know, I know it was always said to me, um, but the people and the dependability, you know, how much we depend on people and treating people fairly and doing what you say you're going to do. I think those have been some of the things that have been a life lesson. And I say that in, especially in this last year to see how people, when we were in such a, a difficult position and everybody was, nobody's unique. We all were challenged, but to see how people rallied around us and helped us uh, was, was just truly humbling and so appreciative. And it, it spoke to me that that work and that what my grandparents and my, my parents continued at, here at Interstate with, uh, with the way that we treat people and, and take care of our employees as best we can and how dependent we are on them to be able to, to be successful. That was a, a life lesson that, uh, that I got to experience. Not that I didn't you know, know it, but to, to get to experience it more in this last year was, it really stands out in my, my mind. Kind of made it real. It made it very real. Yeah. So looking out ahead, what's ahead for interstate? We're very optimistic that there's a lot of opportunity. It is, it has been a challenging year, but it's been, there's an opportunity here. You know, what, what's the saying? Don't let any uh, crisis go unwasted or what, however they say. It. And uh, we've really tried to focus in on that. Again, this is a, a 90 to 100 year old industry. So there's there's been a lot of uh, a lot of change, a lot of things that have happened. There's a lot of things that we've had to do as an industry uh, and as a company that we need we needed to try and work through and correct so that it there was more stability uh, going forward. And and I think we've really worked hard. The teams have to try to maximize that opportunity, those opportunities. So I. I think there's always going to be more kids coming to school. And, and I think that's, uh, I was glad to hear the, uh, I know there was kind of the discussions of virtual learning and things like that, that would be very harmful to our livelihood. Um, but I think, you know, after, especially after this first semester to hear so many administrators from around the country talking about how uh, strained and how far back a lot of kids have slid because they don't have the face-to-face -face learning is very encouraging. Obviously that speaks well for us, that kids will be back in school. You know, we look forward to opportunities to continue to partner with our schools and work with the districts that we've been blessed to work with, uh, across the country, everywhere. And obviously like anybody want opportunities to be able to grow and continue to grow our customer base and work with more people. So we're extremely excited to do that. And we'll, there'll be all kinds of different ways in which we get to do that. And we're excited about it. Well, you've always been an innovative company from the beginning, and I've seen that innovation drive a lot of the growth or perceived growth from the outside. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about what's ahead for you guys. And uh, I know you have another generation of Snyders coming along. And, uh, you know, as a father, uh, you know, you're a busy guy in your business, in your family. Uh, what do you do to kind of break away from that? What do you do for fun? What do you do as a hobby? Anything and everything, you know, my, my son's getting older. He's really wanted to get more involved in hunting. So we've been hunting and fishing more as a new experience with him. Uh, sports, uh, all three of my kids are involved in athletics. And so a lot of events that uh, those in and of themselves <laughs> break you from, <laughs> from the grind because there's a lot of traveling and driving and, and enjoying those events and seeing them get to participate in all that is definitely a way to break away. But I, I kind of, as I said earlier, I just like to experience as much as I can. I woodworking and, and gardening and all kinds of other aspects. I, I, I spent a lot of time on both of those this summer and, and during kind of the lockdown part. So it was nice to be able to get back on that. But I have found that as you know, we were moving and virtual and doing, I've got to get back into uh, really finding defined times to kind of shut down because I, it's easy to get yourself just always working. <laughs> so, well, and that that's another one of those silver linings from the pandemic is the opportunity to spend more time with your family. And, you know, you can only sit in front of a computer so many hours a day, you've got to get away from that. Um, and, uh, you know, learning new things and taking on new hobbies, I think is awesome. How does, uh, as a consumer, how do businesses best communicate with you? 
Well, our customer base is very, I'm going to say unique. I mean, it's not the only, but it is unique that we have a really strong uh, sales and service team that then work with individual schools and school districts, you know, for us to have the opportunity to come in and work with, uh, provide the service to them, provide photography services and yearbooks to the school. So that communication and that marketing is done primarily through face-to-face -face visits, traditionally um, going into schools and knocking on doors and building relationships with either principals or superintendents, whoever it might be. But as, as the pandemic and even before that, doing more and more through marketing automation software to email communication, we do telemarketing, calling and trying to set up opportunities to talk with those decision makers to then allow us access into those schools. Probably the last, in addition to all the printing and everything else that's changed the last 10 years, that's where it, on the marketing side, it's changed a lot in the last 10 to 20 years is in the past, it was, you know, Mr. Principal, Mr. or Mrs. Principal, we're going to work with your school. Now here's 300 flyers and they pass them out to the kids. They go home to mom and then mom fills it out and sends it back into the school brings it back to school and then they hand it to the photographer. That was our, that was it. That was the extent of our marketing. And then the package went home. And so as our website developed, and then as we started building those customer databases, then that's really where a lot of the marketing automation and the change, the way now we have this added huge opportunity to then really reach all of those, our true customer, our true parent customer, customer base and talk with them directly. But it still always pivots around the fact if we work with that school. So it's it's a it's a unique thing where just a, a blanket ad in an area doesn't always make sense because we might not actually work with every school in that area. So it's trying to maximize that opportunity through those channels. That is, I think, a unique business model. Yeah. Um, with the schools being the gateway to your end user, to your consumer. Yeah. You know, I'm sure everybody could say this, but it's, you know, it's custom. Everything we always try to do is always custom because it's like, well, it's kind of like a fundraiser. Yeah, no. You know, and so it's, it's weird, you know, when trying to work with uh, automation software and other things, it's, it's just a unique beast. So when you spoke about technology earlier, that's usually where most people are most surprised because we do have to develop and build a lot of our own software because it, it is just so truly unique because it doesn't follow, you know, traditional sales processes. Yeah. So what about Eric, the consumer? How do you get your information? I probably fit more into the, the research guy. I mean, definitely email, email marketing probably is what catches my eye, at least gets me going down a rabbit hole. So I would say probably a, a direct mail or, you know, email communication with me. And then that's where then I usually, if I'm wanting to explore something or get into something, then that's usually where I start going down. And then always amazed by the uh, generated uh, ads that pop up on everything that <laughs> everything I'm on. It's that marketing thing. It is. It's, they're so sneaky. Yeah. So they tease you with an email, they draw you in, you do a lot of research on your own and then try to find the best place to buy something. And that's what's so much fun. You know, you spoke about the marketing too and getting to know your customers. That's, that is what you've learned when you're in a marketing department is you have to set your preferences aside and really identifying who your customer is. And you may not agree with it, but this is what they do. So, you know, you gotta, you just, you've got to follow your customer. And again, it just full circle comes back to people. Eric, I appreciate uh, you being with us today. Uh, you've had so many great things to say. Um, I really like the way you described your culture from your unique perspective and, and how everything really revolves around people when you're in the service business and, and also the idea of community and, and um, you know, within your family business, communications and trust. Uh, what else would you like to share with our audience today that you think they might find interesting or beneficial? You know, our, our mission is to share the power of a smile. And I think it's at the core of what we do, those memories that last generations that, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it's as, as important at the moment, you know, for a picture or for something that documents and a memory or, or a point in time. And, uh, 
we try hard to provide the best quality and product and service that we can, but to really preserve that power of a smile and how important that will be to to your family and to all families, you know, down the road, especially every year that becomes more valuable. And uh, we're really blessed to have been able to have the opportunity to do this for as long as we have. And and we hope to be able to do it for many more years. So it's uh, been very blessed to be in such a, and offer such a, a unique and uh, fun product over the years. Well, we wish you all the best as you go forward. And I love the idea of the power of a smile because it is powerful. Yeah. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you, Cliff. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Eric Snyder, Jr. of Interstate Studio. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.